of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank you for this gathering tonight and for the speakers we are about to hear. We ask that the Holy Spirit come upon this room and help us to be inspired by the life of Saint Louis and the Limatin. We ask for the intercession of our Mother, Mother Mary as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Saint Joachim, pray for us. Saint Louis and Saint Martin, pray for us. Saint Therese, pray for us.
Uh, and it all started here. And I don't forget that. And every time I come here, including tonight, I always make the point to go in front of that statue again and say a little prayer. And um, I think I hope to be able to do that uh, for whatever days I've got left in the education profession. I want to thank you for the invitation tonight. It's always a great honour to speak uh, about our faith or aspects of our faith to an audience uh, and hear it. Then I feel very much at home. I've been asked to talk about the um, martyrs, and I've been asked to talk about what they teach us about being parents. So I'm going to be very careful and let you know that I wish I was following the advice I'm going to give you tonight. Because it's a lot easier to teach about these things than it is to live them out. I'm also very conscious not to give you 101 ways of being a great parent. Because I know attending many talks myself, uh, that you often hear great speakers who've got a lot to say and they say it very well, but you, you leave thinking, oh, there's too much here for me to adapt or adopt or implement in my life. So I'm going to give you some pointers and uh, I'm going to emphasize three points in particular. And if you work on them in your life, as I try to do in my life, uh, I think we'll be all the better for it. So let's start with looking at the Martins. As a, as a saintly couple. I have a quote here from their daughter, St. Teresa the Infant Jesus, who said the following, The good God gave me a father and a mother more worthy of heaven than of earth. Now I imagine it's great to be parents of a great saint. But the great saint here, St. Teresa the Infant Jesus, first learned the ways of holiness from great parents. Louis and Zelie Martin are only one of ten canonized couples we have in the church. Now, when I looked up that number for the first time, I wanted verification and tried to look at other sources about who these couples are. And then I came to realize other websites named more than ten couples. Many of these couples are famous in history. They could have been kings and queens or etc. like Henry II and his wife Cunningham of the Holy Roman Empire around the year AD 1000 through then. So many of them are not necessarily obscure, ordinary people. I guess it's a bit of a shame that we don't have more lay people and or more married couples who are canonised. Only because the vast majority of the church, that is 98%, are lay people. So I guess we've got a little bit of work there to do, both in the church and both among ourselves. To be, uh, to live the normal everyday holiness. I still think there's that mentality, it's not altogether a bad mentality, it's a good mentality, but not necessarily the best mentality, that a serious Catholic faithful life is for those who consecrate themselves in religious life or priestly service. Uh, I, certainly that's, I certainly hope that's the case for all people who do that. But the reality is, is that um, we're baptised people, we're sanctified people, we're anointed people, and we're called also to holiness. And the Second Vatican Council emphasised that very strongly. That holiness is not reserved for a certain class of Catholics, uh, a small minority, but it's something that's a calling for all of us. The message of Louis and Zelly is not new. It's the way of the gospel applied in their circumstances. The way of unselfish, sacrificial love. Now that's the first point I want us to focus on. I think it might be taken for granted. I guess we all agree with it. But I think what, that's one of the hardest things to practice. The reason why I emphasize this point goes back to a time when I was working in the Confraternity of Christian Doctrine in Polling Centre in the CBD. And I used to attend the lunchtime mass. And the, on occasions, there was this one particular priest who was working in the marriage tribunal. And we celebrate mass for us at 12 noon. And for some reason, one day, he gave a little homily which, which was completely disconnected from the actual gospel. And that was all right. He must have been going through some form of frustration through his work in the marriage tribunal. And he said, the problem with young people today and all the marriages that I'm dealing with, the broken down marriages, 
is that young people don't know how to be unselfish. They don't know, they don't know how to live unselfish lives as individuals or as a married couple. And he identified that as a core reason why many of the marriages he was dealing with were breaking down. Now that struck me. And I think it had some resonance with me, of course, as a human being, is prone to selfishness, etc. Sadly, that priest was to die one week later suddenly of a heart attack. And uh, I mean, that's completely disconnected with what he said, but I, I, I'll, at least, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, in, in his work with the marriage tribunal, he was doing his best to preserve marriages and whatever, whatever, but he was actually experiencing a lot of frustration because of this prevalent condition among young people. They're not taught to be unselfish, to be sacrificial people. This couple, the subject of our talk tonight, was certainly people of great unselfishness and willing to engage in great sacrifice for each other and for their children. <coughs> Louis and Zelly showed the ordinary way of heroically living out the Christian life. Now to be a saint, to be a canonised saint, and don't forget there are millions and millions and millions of people in heaven who are all saints but not canonised, okay? And I hope I'm in that category one day. We don't need to be canonised, we just need to be recognised by God and be in heaven and if then you get there, that's enough, right? But when the church goes through a canonisation process, what it's doing is that it's recognising a person or a year, a particular couple, who practice heroic virtue. You know, Jesus talked about the sower of the seed, and he saw the seed that fell in the good soil. And in the version in Matthew's Gospel, not Luke's, but in Matthew's Gospel, you have the seed that grows 30, 60, and 100. There's a differentiation there, isn't there? The Gospel, or God's grace, is received in the good soil, but not everyone responds to it to the same degree. The 30 are good, the 60 are very good, and the 100 are great, and the 100 would be those we would consider heroic virtue, who would be recognised and put up as models for the rest of the church. So this couple showed the ordinary way of heroism. And the reason why I say that is normally when you read the lives of the saints, and I think about a lot when I, when I came to the uh, practice of the Catholic faith very seriously in my uh, early 20s, I love to read the lives of the saints, you know, the, the St. Bernard's and the St. Dominic's and the St. Francis. And when you read their lives, it, it's extraordinary way of holiness. And you probably think, oh gosh, that's nice, but that's not me. I can't do that. I can't be like St. Bernard and found 169 new monasteries and, um, you know, uh, <coughs> write the rule for the Knights Templar and preach the Second Crusade and bring disputes between the Holy Roman Empire and the, and the papacy to an end and uh, do miracles here, there and everywhere. That's not for me, but it was for him. Okay? And sometimes we think, okay, that's nice, but I'll just do my ordinary thing. Well, we're meant to do our ordinary thing. We're, we're meant to do our ordinary thing in a faithful way um, and consistently with integrity. And I think that's what we're mostly called to be or to do. Now, at first, when Louis and Zelly met and they fell in love and they got married, they committed themselves to live an extraordinary way as a married couple. And that is they decided that they would live celibate lives. And that's extraordinary to say the least. I know some people who might do that as a temporary thing, but they had determined originally to do, them, to do that as a permanent thing. Until they had the advice of a very saintly priest who told them that in actual fact, really you will better serve God if you do what's normal and natural in marriage and have children. So they went to one great extreme and then they decided to go to another great extreme. So they made the determination that we're going to have as many children for God as we can. Now, they were economically pretty well off for 
people in France at that time. Um, Louis was a watchmaker and uh, Zali was, uh, worked with lace. So they had a good income, so perhaps they could afford a, a, a size of family larger than the average. They ended up having nine children all. I know some people have that many today. The vast majority of people cannot have that many today. Would like to have something large, but our economic situation probably prevents that for most people. They had nine children all up. And that shows their enormous generosity and openness to life and openness to God and openness to God's providence and trust in God's providence, um, no matter what life, life lay ahead. Uh, I remember myself, when I got married, I was afraid. I didn't show it, I didn't say anything, but I was afraid. I was nervous. Uh, I was paranoid about the future. Uh, I was on a teacher's salary then back in the year 1999. I was only 47000 a year. And I thought, you know, my wife, my wife starts having children and she's not going to be working. How am I going to support my family? I did calculations that uh, my bank account would be empty in four and a half years and things like that. And, and the rate that my wife was spending and etc. etc. Et and uh, see, that was, a, that was a lack of trust in God's providence. And I found out very soon, well before four and a half years, that God certainly provides. Because even after my wife had two kids in two years, uh, I got a second job, part-time job. And it went from there from, from better to better. And I played and I would consider that God's providence to look after me. Well, the, this couple, Louis and Zelly, had enormous trust in God's providence. Even while supporting such a large family, they were still supporting the local poor in their activities outside of the home and financially. Now, there was a lot of suffering in their life. A lot of tragedy. I was just thinking about that, those two Lebanese families who lost their children on the first of February, the four children. And I pray that something like that never happens to me or my family. To lose three children in one family and another child in a second family on the same day, as we all know, was horrific. And as soon as I heard about that story, on radio that Sunday morning. I didn't know who they were. The, the radio station didn't mention the name of the families or their ethnic background or their religious background. But I did feel real serious pain because I imagined that was me and my family. That Louis and Sally went through something akin to that. Not all in one go, but they lost four children out of the nine. And two of them were sons. And remember, I, I should have mentioned this point earlier, that they were hoping as a married couple that they would have plenty of sons because they wanted to give them as, as priests to the church. Of course, they were, they were ultimately would be their choice as boys growing up into men. They dreamed about having sons who would become priests, but all the sons they had died, and none of them therefore would become priests. And then there's more suffering when the great Zelly that develops cancer and dies at the age of only 45. And we have, and that was breast cancer, and we have Louis left to look after his five daughters. And as we know, God took those five daughters in a different way. Each one of them entered the calm. Each one of them entered religious life. We know that one of them is now a canonized saint. We know that another one is, has a process open heading in the same direction. What would Louis say about the fact that his five daughters all that joined the carnal, none of them married, none of them had children, Louis could never become a grandfather, and Louis would be left alone at home? How did Louis respond to that? He said the following, It is a great, great honour for me that the good Lord desires to take all of my children. If I had anything better, I would not hesitate to offer it to him. 
What do we see there? What's the one word that embodies that statement? Sacrifice. That Louis was a person prepared to sacrifice his own desires and his own will in favour of God's will for him and his family. In the end, Louis died in 1894 after suffering greatly, after spending three years in the psychiatric hospital every day for three years. His life, in a sense, became much like Job's in the end, the Job we read about in the Old Testament. He lost his wife, he, in a sense, he lost four of his children to premature death. He lost, in inverted commas, his five daughters to the Carmel, which was, he considered the great lesson, and not really a loss, of course. He never became a grandfather, and he lost his mind in the end. So that way he became very much like Job, who lost everything, but only to be rewarded later more greatly by, the, by God. As we read in Job 121, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In his last days, I'm sure Louis would have said that if he was capable of saying that. Knowing what he went through, what afflictions he went through, I highly, I strongly believe he would never have complained, he would never have been embittered, he would have embraced the process, and he would have blessed God for everything that had come his way. Now I want to talk about how this great couple modelled in their lives being exemplars for family life and for raising children. And then I'm going to go into general principles as well. And I'll start off by looking at a quote from St Paul in his letter to the Ephesians. This quote is highly controversial. If I read it in full, some of you wouldn't be happy perhaps. I'll read it in full. But then I'll emphasise what is relevant when it comes to us as parents, as happy parents. Ephesians 5, 21 and 28, some of you will be very familiar with these words. Words that certainly wouldn't be politically correct today. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now that's not controversial. In fact, I would say that part of this quote is the part that is most often overlooked. And it's overlooked because of the words that follow. Let's read that again. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here's St. Paul. Imagine he's talking to a married couple, a man and a woman, husband and wife. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. If I was to stop there and unpack that, and I will unpack it eventually, we will see there that what St. Paul is saying is that the married couple are living for each other a servant sacrificing for each other. Be subject to one another means to respect and meet each other's needs. There's not an imbalance here, you know, I own you, you're mine, you do what I want, you serve me. Okay? It's actually in great balance where in a sense, this is not a good word, but they own each other equally. They are equal in dignity as human beings, different as man and woman, sure, but equal in dignity as human beings. And they uh, serve each other, they reverence each other, they meet each other's needs. Then we, these words are forgotten because of the following words. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the law. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body and is himself the saviour. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Now, I'm not going to unpack that tonight because the dog totally distract me for the rest of the presentation. But I think a lot of people mis mistake this, these words and they say, well, okay, this justifies all the male domination and all the chauvinism and all the misogyny that we have in, in society and in, the, in our culture and in our families. And perhaps some people do mistake these words to justify those evils. Then we get into the next thing, which is more in line with the first words of what St. Paul said. Husbands, love your wives 
as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, etc., etc. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And these last words remind us of St. Paul's first words in this quote, but elaborates on them because he gives the example. He's talking to husbands now, love your wives, how? As Christ loved the church. So how did Christ love the church? And we only need to look at a crucifix to answer that question. How did Christ love the church? He sacrificed his own life for the life of his spouse, the church. So there's the model for husbands. So when a husband is, is and I presume Louis was like this without any doubt, when a husband is willing to live like Christ for others and to be willing to sacrifice for others to the ultimate end degree, when Christ was on the cross, all his blood came from his body. He sacrificed himself entirely out of love for others. Then, when you're like, there's no room for these evils I spoke about earlier, of domination and oppression and or misogyny or, or even lust, which I should add into the picture here, because lust is not an expression of authentic love, but really an expression of selfishness where you're using the other person selfishly for your own pleasure. You want the pleasure, but you don't want to serve, sacrifice, or suffer for that other person in the short or long term. Now, am I being serious here when I quote St. Paul? And I certainly am. Because you can't be model parents to children if you're not model spouses to each other. If there's any form of strife or conflict or disorder in the marital relationship, then you, you lose your credibility as models for your children. Now, you've probably all experienced this to some degree or another. You know, if the mum and dad are fighting, you know, the kids suffer, the kids see, the kids hear everything, and your authority as an exemplar for your children is rapidly diminished. But coming back, applying St. Paul, his words here, and reflecting on the fact that uh, Zelly, sorry, Louis and Zelie were recognised by the church as a model of husband and model parents, what should we develop from St. Paul's quote? That marriage is not about domination, for a start. Family life is not about domination. If one spouse is dominating the other, or parents dominate the children in a manner that's repressive, then we have serious disorder. We do not have a loving relationship. We do not have a loving family situation. Marriage is about partnership, it's about complementarity, and it's about mutual submission. Now, I've got friends who don't like the term mutual submission, because they view that the headship of the man or the, the husband or the father is a supreme headship um, and they, they feel threatened when you talk about mutual submission. They're very happy to hear about the wife submitting to the husband but they're uncomfortable about this mutual submission thing. I want to emphasize partnership because God has brought the two together for a higher end, for higher ends. The two come together to serve each other in their needs on earth, but also in their need to walk the journey to heaven. And I also want to mention and emphasize complementarity, because that's something our modern culture undermines severely. Now, equality is good, but equality between the sexes does not, nor should it mean sameness. Man and woman are equal in human dignity. But they are not the same, and I don't need to elaborate to make that obvious point. God made man and woman different so that they would be complementary, so they would complete each other for their own good and their own happiness. So they first, when they encounter each other, they find mystery. And in unpacking that mystery, they find joy. 
and then they find fulfillment in each other. So this cultural move that we have to just eradicate all differences between man and woman, so I could be a man today and a woman tomorrow, it's called gender fluidity, so all this, what we're hearing about in the popular culture, undermines God's plan for humanity. That humanity, the human, not just the individual human person is in the image and likeness of God, but the married couple are in the image and likeness of God because of their difference, because of their complementarity, and because their union is fruitful. And their difference, their complementarity and fruitfulness reflect the Trinity. Where we have a father who knows himself and he gets the son, and there's a mutual knowledge between the father and the son, and that mutual knowledge breeds, that's not the best word, but generates, that's a better technical word, a third person we call the Holy Spirit. And the human family reflects that. So there needs to be difference between man and woman, and that difference must be expressed in complementarity and union that's fruitful. I'm not afraid to say that the man is the head because St. Paul is the, says that. Some people might say it's pretty fundamentalist, right? I've been accused of being fundamentalist. I, I can be rude in my response, but I won't be rude, but I'll be fun if possible. If someone called me fundamentalist, I'll say, look, I accept the fun, but not the mental. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't think I'm being fundamentalist because I like to always balance the man's headship with the woman's hardship. The man is the head and the woman is the heart. Try and have a human person with a head and no heart. We argue monstrosity. Try and have a human person with a heart and not a head. It's not going to work. You have the two together in the one to make that one work effectively. And in their differences, the man and the woman complement and complete each other and perfect each other. I have certain strengths, my wife doesn't have. My wife has certain strengths, I don't have. When it comes to shopping and bargaining, keep me out of the picture. I'm happy if I get one dollar off, my wife goes for a maximum discount. She's much tougher than me when it comes to money. She saved me tens of thousands of dollars over the years. If she has that strength, I don't have. So that's one perhaps humorous way of exhibiting complementarity. Both are necessary, the heart and the head. Your headship, and I'm speaking here to the males in particular, but this also applies to the, to the female, because especially with respect to the children as well. Your headship, your heart should exist to, in order for the betterment of others. If you got married so that you're, you are to be served and expect others, your wife, your husband, or your children to better you and serve you and you don't reciprocate, well, I'm sorry, that's not a Christian marriage. You exist, you have this headship and hardship in order to be people of service, sacrifice, and suffering. That's how we model Christ's uh, headship that St. Paul spoke about in Ephesians 5. If I finish now, I know it's got about seven minutes, I have to brush a little bit now. If you were to leave now, just remember those three words. That you are meant to be a person of service, sacrifice and suffering. And if you are that person, then you can't be that person naturally by the It's the original sin, we're instinctively hyper-selfish. Christ came to reorder our love. And simple teachings like, love God with all your mind, body, heart and soul. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love your enemy. Love God. Do good to those who are with you. This simple teaching we're familiar with was nevertheless a very serious core teaching of Christ to reorder our love. Because that priest in that mass back in Holy Center was correct. Selfishness is an expression of disordered love, excessive self love. And that is the cause of ruination in so many marriages and so many relationships. So the road to happiness in marriage, in relationships, and family life, as practiced by the Martins, is this formula to serve, sacrifice, and to suffer. And ask them to ask God for the grace to be transformed in that manner. And ask God for that grace every day, because you might start well and do it for two or three weeks, but then the old habits come back 
and then it starts to fall apart again, and you wonder, oh, that was a good two or three weeks, but what happened? If you can get this happening on a lifetime, long term basis, that you will have the closest thing to heaven on earth. Your marriage is meant to make, make you happy on earth as a prelude to happiness in heaven, the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. And we don't have those type of marriages and that level of happiness because of our core selfishness. And only God's grace can break that and dissolve that and transform you to be a person who loves outwardly. To look at the other as someone I exist for. I don't just, I'm not to live just with my wife or with my children. I'm live, I, I exist to live for them, for my wife and for my children. And if you can reach that level and your wife reach that level, you have paradise on earth. And you have that integrity to model as a parent for your children and to inspire your children to be the faithful Catholics, faithful Christians, they, God wants them to be. Five minutes, and I said I would give you 101 points. But I will give you about 10. But the core I've already given you, service, sacrifice and suffering that you get from God's grace. But these things I'm about to tell you are more mechanical things that you should be doing to have that atmosphere in the home like the Martin household. You've got to exhibit faith on a daily basis within the home. You've got to have Jesus, Mary and Joseph as your friends in that daily conversation. Daily prayer should be visible in the home. Your children should see you pray. I don't know if I mentioned, I should have, that the Martin family, the parents, exhibited prayer publicly in the home in front of their children. I know people who say they never saw their parents pray. They never ever saw their dad on their knees, on his knees. They never saw their dad or their mum go to confession. And as they became people of faith, they realised that was a big hole in their lives and their upbringing. Are we people who model fasting and abstinence and discipline? Because without those disciplines today, how are our children going to grow up with all the appetites, particularly with the sexual the influences we have today? To practice examination of conscience privately once a day. To go to Mass regularly, at least once a week, that's what the Church says. You know, we have a terrible deficit when it comes to Mass attendance for our young people. And I know, we've got the stats at Sydney Catholic Schools office, we see who is not going to Mass in our student body. We, in our definition of regular Mass attendance, that's defined as one per, once per month. And it's about 9-10% once per month. If we're parents and we model mass attendance, sometimes your kids might fall off for a period, but if you keep modeling them and stay consistent, that's a great way to help them back. You need to have rest time and family time on the Sunday. People grow up, men grow up, they have successful careers, they retired 55, 60, they loaded with money, their children are strangers. They never gave time, quality time, to be together as a family, to be with their children. They, as I said earlier, children growing up never, said, never saw their parents in the confession line. Confession once a month would be fabulous. I'm not saying you have to do once a month, it would, but it would be fabulous if you did. That scripture is quoted and referred to and acknowledged and reverenced in the home. That we talk about saints and we talk about how great they were and how inspirational they were. And that, you know, we're not afraid to talk about the faith in normal conversation with our kids and the daily struggles associated with that. Ephesians 6, 4, St. Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. When your kids get older, my kids are getting older now, and my two boys are adults and I'm trying to get used to the fact that they 
go out at night and come back late. And one of them's got a girlfriend now. I think that's way too early. And what do I do about it? I just pray and I hope for the best. Right? Don't impose because it's not domination. Just say to your children, you're free to do whatever God inspires you to do so long as, and I won't interfere, so long as there's no sin or immorality involved. If you want to, you know, get your medicine degree, and you see the men that come working in the canteen at school, and that's what you want to do for the rest of your life, okay, so long as it doesn't involve sin or immorality. So give your, respect your children's freedom. Don't trample them, don't dominate them. Don't say you have to be like this. Don't say to your children, you have to be first in school. No, say to your children, you have to do your best and do it honestly. Respect them as persons, respect them as emerging adults, respect their freedom and give them the parameters. Don't say it's hope and slow, but do whatever you want. Do whatever you want, like St. Augustine said. Um, I'm trying to remember the quote, you know, um, love and do whatever you want. I say do whatever you want without sin, as so long as no sin is involved. And also, I'm, I've got a couple of minutes, I know I'm going over time, I apologise, but I think this is worthwhile stuff. There's something I call Nazareth Syndrome. Jesus had Nazareth Syndrome, or he suffered from it. He was a victim of Nazareth Syndrome, what's that? He was rejected by his own town, his own village. You're not a prophet in your own home. He was not a prophet in Nazareth. If Jesus couldn't be a prophet in Nazareth, then sometimes we're not going to be prophets in our own home. So if you want to get your message across, which is a good message about the faith and life, get someone else, a third party, a fourth party, to have influence in your home, in your garden, to get the message that you want to, cross, what you want to get across. Because I guarantee you, your children will be more likely to listen to them than to listen to you. But you've achieved your objective through a third or fourth party. And I've actually employed that at times, and it does work. It has worked. I just finished this, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll leave a few points out, but I'll finish on this note. The message of these two saints, Louis and Zelie Martin, is a simple one. It's a message that sanctity is not beyond our reach, that Christ wants us to be holy and is there and is willing to help us to achieve that end. The saints were human like us, and we, we need not be afraid or daunted by the greatness of these saints. The church recognises this married couple to tell us that ordinary people can be saints and to give us encouragement and hope that we can walk up the ladder of holiness and up the ladder to heaven. It is just such greatness that Jesus has in mind for each one of us, the greatness of the little ones. And on that note I'll finish and with this little invocation, if you could respond to this please, Saints Louis and Zelie, pray for us. Thank you.